when you know we, we've all um, I'm sure read these stories about Britain um, how much Britain pays to the EU um, and you know the weird thing about the the big lie um, about how much money Britain would save by not being in the EU is that they didn't need to lie. Mm. The 350 million a week figure is, is nonsense. Um, but um, but the truth is something like 150 yeah. million. Uh, you know, if they said that, then I think people would just have been, yeah. have been just as, as, as annoyed. So you wonder why they lie. So there is that, um, that excess that Britain does give. And in the past, that mainly went towards agricultural subsidies. Mm -hmm. But more and more, it's gone towards infrastructure. And most of that infrastructure is at the periphery uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, and um, you, you get into that, that realm, which I find really interesting, about the way that the debate about Brexit um, is going in this country, or has gone in the last three years, um, although we're all completely nauseous now um, with it. But um, on the lever, on, on the Remainer side, um, I do feel that it's all about Britain, even the Remainers. I mean, if, if you were a pure Remainer, if you really, really believed in the EU, then what you would be saying, of course, you wouldn't say this, but what you would be saying is uh, not, this is what's good for Britain. You'd say, this is what's good for Europe. Um, and, um, but that might be bad for Britain. And you have to then come, if you start seeing Europe as something like um, a country, um, which certainly some people um, in places like France and Belgium would like, um, then you, know, you start getting into that, that world of, of centres and peripheries um, and, and you start having to come to terms with the fact that the Britain is, is on the edge and Germany is in the middle. Um, and it's quite hard, it was quite hard for me uh, looking at all the information I was getting in Western Poland and uh, looking at the companies who were there, um, looking at the, the map and thinking, well, yes, the Poles are getting a lot out of all these roads and bridges, but so are the Germans, um, mm -hmm. because they've basically got a massive cheap um, workforce on their doorsteps mm -hmm. uh, and a whole new road system to um, shuttle their, their goods and, and spare parts between these, these two countries. So um, in whole European terms, that's probably um, a good thing. But is it good for... Is it, is it good for Britain? Well, certainly, yeah. There are some people in Keynesham who don't, who don't think so. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's a difficult area mm. um, because, you know, that, that is beyond the, the, the debate in Britain um, between Leavers and Remainers. Uh, there, there is that, that fundamental problem um, at the heart of, of the EU project mm. um, that until some German politician can go to Scunthorpe and make a speech to the steelworkers and, their, and, and say, you know, for the good of Europe, your steelworks has to close. In the same way that Michael, Steel, uh, Michael Foote went to steelworkers in Wales in the 1980s and, and, and sort of talked them down. Um, until that can happen, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a weakness in the, in the whole project. So, so you cover three other areas which we won't talk about in, in detail, except for, for one little bit. Um, you cover farming and in Norfolk and you cover um, fisheries in Grimsby and new industries there. Um, but you also cover the health service in mm. Leicestershire. And um, there, you know, it wasn't just the big lie about the £350 million which you cover, but also the, the sheer crisis which is facing the health service. Now, that's beyond the EU uh, debate in a way. Um, but, yes. but, 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 you know, how do we... As we, as we move into building a new Britain, how, what do we do about that as a problem? I don't know. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hoping you no, know the answer. I know, I know, I know, I know. No, I mean, I, 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 do have, I do have an idea, but it's an extremely abstract one, um, and, and it goes way beyond the health mm. service. I mean, the, the particular problems of the health service... Um, uh, I, I don't know, I just, I just wrote the article, I, I, I said what I, what I thought, what I found out, um, but it was interesting that a, a number of people <coughs> sent to me um, that compared to some of my earlier articles about privatisation, this one seemed um, a bit more, um, how can I put it, um, that uh, it wasn't so sort of politically engaged, mm. that, that I, I seemed to um, accept 
that um, there are big objective problems here that aren't necessarily amenable to kind of standard political solutions. I mean, for example, um, I, I found it very striking that in Leicestershire, which is sort of, you know, quite a, a representative area of the country as a whole, um, there was a general acceptance that more money had to be spent on the health service, but people I spoke to who were not by any means poor weren't willing, you know, didn't like the idea of paying extra taxes themselves. Um, I think some of these polls um, that ask, do you think more money should be paid on the National Health Service and do you think taxes should be raised to, um, to pay for the National Health Service? I think there would be very different results if the question was, should your taxes be raised? Um, I think this whole discourse of the 99% um, has rather um, uh, protected people from the, the fact that, uh, that not everyone who would pay more in, in a more re redistributive society would be obviously rich. Mm. Um, it, it might just, you know, it would probably be the middle class. Mm. Um, so, um, so, yes. Um, that was uh, that was interesting. I mean, the uh, the objective problem that the uh, that the NHS faces, um, which relates to what we were talking about before in terms of, of robots and uh, and chocolate, um, is that uh, you can't replace a nurse with with a robot. Uh, you can't replace a doctor. I mean, God knows they're trying, but um, you can't do it. Um, whereas every day, somewhere in the world, there's, a, there's an assembly line of workers who, either because machines have for the first time become available or because the workers have become too expensive, um, they've um, they found a way to replace them with machines. Um, so, in other words, if you're on the side of the economy where robots can easily be brought in, you're getting, um, you're getting richer much quicker. Uh, and it may be, I mean, this is where the theory breaks down a bit, it may be that, in fact, the workers in those who, who are left in those robot-rich industries actually end up getting paid more because there are just a few of them um, and they have to be quite high skill to kind of, you know, wipe the sweat off the, <laughs> off the robot's brows. Um, but, and then you have the problem that the workers who cannot be replaced by robots, their wages have to keep pace with the, uh, the human workers in the robot-rich industries. Um, and the only way of doing that, well, what, what is the way of doing that? Where did you get the money from? The, the way of, um, the obvious way of getting more money would seem to be to charge higher taxes. Um, on the robot-rich industries, which is why um, Bill Gates um, said recently, and if you didn't know the context, you'd think, why is he suddenly saying this? We need to tax robots. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't understand this, this kind of difference between the robot-rich and the robot-light industries, then, then you think, where did that come from? Um, so that is, that is, that is the problem. That it, uh, right, as things are set up now, um, it's much easier for uh, companies who are able to automate, to suck money out of the economy, uh, to stash it in tax havens, uh, and to keep it away from the, uh, the service industries where automation isn't, isn't so easy. Uh, and that needs, to, that needs to be changed. So, so the, the classic um, arguments that, um, that you will have heard that um, there needs to be um, a clampdown on, on tax havens, there needs to be uh, a more um, aggressive uh, attitude towards, uh, towards tax evasion in general. That's absolutely right. Um, but the trouble is we've got to the point now where unless you spread that around the entire world, um, then this incredibly fluid global capital that you have is just going to trickle to, to the country uh, that, where the taxes are lowest. Um, so um, that's my kind of bigger idea, uh, which is that if you look at the world as a whole, 
to the extent that there is a global politics. Um, you have mechanisms, you have uh, very badly working ones, but they're still there. You have, um, you have ideas, you have concepts that are sort of lodged in people's mind um, that human rights are important. People shouldn't just be locked up in prison and tortured um, for their beliefs. Um, and, and if there's a country which is uh, a particularly egregious abuser of human rights, they will face consequences. It will become, in one way or another, a pariah, um, as, as well as the fact that its own people will be very unhappy. Um, similarly, you have um, a country which turns its back on the free market, like Cuba or, or North Korea, um, will be shunned or will face quite severe consequences. Uh, the, the global financial system will find every way it can to, to try and uh, put pressure on this country to, to open up its markets. So you have these two um, very deeply lodged uh, ideas, systems um, in, in the world, uh, in the political world as a whole. Um, but you don't have a similar idea for how a country like Britain, which, where people pay quite high taxes uh, and where we have relatively good, deteriorating, but relatively good public services, how we relate to a country uh, which, which may well be um, competing with us in terms of products and cheap labour, um, how we relate to a country which doesn't uh, uh, charge high taxes. Well, let, let's take Russia, for example. I mean, okay, everyone... everyone um, weighs in on Russia, um, but just because I happen to know a bit about it, um, it's an example. Um, they do not have such um, good public services as, as we do. Um, they, they certainly have, um, to a much greater extent than some others, they have an idea that everyone should have free health care, that education should be universal, that's great. Um, but they have an incredibly low rate of taxation. Basically, if you're rich in Russia, then there are so many ways that you can avoid uh, paying, paying tax. Um, and the, the fact that living conditions in so many Russian cities are so poor, and yet you have uh, billionaires there who are able to buy football teams in, um, in London um, is, uh, is a sign uh, of, of how askew the... Um, the global tax system is. Um, and at the moment, far from um, doing anything about this, uh, as far as the prevailing regime in Britain is concerned, is that we don't care. That's absolutely fine, because it's just more billionaires who will uh, use the city of London to, uh, to launder, their, launder their money, launder their money, you know, legally, um, through London, onto the tax havens, onto Switzerland. Um, that's, that's the way it's done. Um, and if, if we can uh, get uh, a little bit of your money as you're passing, uh, then that's, that's great. Uh, and that's, that's not going to work. That's not good. That's, that's, the, that's the target that I think uh, we need to be working towards. Um, a, a, third, um, a third instinctive concept um, the, there was this phrase that you kept hearing when the, uh, the time that communism was collapsing in Eastern Europe, um, democracy and the free market. Um, but that's not enough. There needs to be a third concept. Democracy, uh, the free market, and fairly shared wealth. Without that, uh, we're going to fall short.